Hey everybody, um, welcome to, goodness, this is chapter 9 of Pilgrim of the Sky Live. Um, if you've been following along, we are going through the progress of my novel, Pilgrim of the Sky, which came out a couple years ago by a publisher called Candle Marking Gleam. And I decided that it would be a fun thing to do a live read-along since it's something that I enjoy doing. And sounds like so far, I have a couple people following anyway. Um, so if you've been following along, um, you probably aren't too, too lost. If you haven't, I probably don't recommend that you jump right in unless you're just really excited and things will make sense to you. But Pilgrim of the Sky is what I best describe as myth punk. So it's sort of mythology fantasy. And our main character here is named Maddie Angler, and she has just finished a rather romantic evening with someone named Randall. And now she has decided, um, after he has shown his rather cowardly colors, to leave in search of someone named Joss Raddick. Now, this is a little exciting for me because I did just finish a novel that's all about Joss Raddick um, and his background and who he is, which you'll find out in a couple of chapters. I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's exciting to see the two books kind of come together um, for me anyway. So, and hopefully the handful of you who have followed along so far. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to jump into it. Remember, you can purchase the book if you'd like to read along over on Amazon.com. You can also follow me over here at Natanya Barron on Twitter if you'd like to. Um, and uh, my website is natanyabaron.com as well. So this is Chapter 9, and it's called Charleston. It took some time to reach the street again, but no sooner had the door slammed on the carriage than Maddie was thrown aside. With a violent shove, Maddie was thrust back out of control. She had never been pushed away so easily before, especially without opium, and the effect was dizzying. She could still see Randall lingering at the docking area, staring after the carriage they had taken. Had she chosen wrong? What's going on? Maddie tried to ask, but Matilda wasn't answering. Another push, and Maddie was shoved out of Matilda's body entirely, unable to feel or see for quite some time. Amidst the blackness, she had a few flashes, Matilda settling a few things at the house, drinking a cup of opium tea, changing into a riding gown, slipping a knife and a derringer into her boot. None of it boded well. Once they were in the carriage again and westward bound, Maddie was at least granted sight again. Matilda couldn't keep her stranglehold on her forever, it seemed. From her own experience, utter control was hard work and exhausting. Maddie sensed Matilda was keeping her strength for something. Yet she could not stay silent forever. As Maddie let memories and regrets wash over her, Matilda had to taunt her. Poor little lovebird, but Randall? Really? He's such a bore, she said. It's not Randall, said Maddie. It's everything. It's, oh, you're so dramatic. It really is pathetic. Can we just get this over with? I want to go home. Charleston was a two-hour journey in a vaguely northwest direction, and after that, Maddie quiet waited quietly at the back of Matilda's mind while she watched the landscape change around them. The world may have still been blanketed in snow, but after scarcely an hour of driving, it bore no resemblance to the Victorian elegance of Farley and the floating mansions of Boston. The palatial homes and buildings gave way to more rudimentary storage houses and abodes, and the streets were bumpier. They came more factories, plants, and even a smattering of farms. Even deeper, and the bridges were painfully unattended to as well, jolting the carriage back and forth as they traveled over rough, icy water below. Then came trees and little else. Why would anyone want to live out here? Maddie asked. It's not a matter of wanting. They're stationed out here. They're the river guard. The Charles River, Charlton, Ma Matilda explained. I get that, said Maddie. A head loomed huge garrison, rising out of the horizon, abutted by a fortified bridge. It was at least a hundred feet tall and constructed of dull stone and wrought iron, crenellated around the tops. It was still light out, but blue fire burned at the top of each of the four turrets, the garrison stretched in both directions as far as the eye could see, a wall of impenetrable rock. Mary guards this place, said Matilda, 
muttering to herself, the fires still burn. As in the mother, mother Mary, I'm guessing? Maddie was still trying to keep up. When she started losing the present, she could feel her own consciousness slipping away. Matilda was strong, stronger than she'd ever been. But Maddie did not want to keep her guard down, did not want to let Matilda know how frightened she felt. The priestesses of Mary come here and keep her fires burning, explained Matilda. It's one of her things, you know, the blue fire, an as-of-yet unexplained phenomenon. What chances are, if Alvin or Randall had the time and the inclination, they could explain it in terms of science? Regardless, the good news is that if it's blue, it means we're safe. There are no enemies within sight. And who might these enemies be? Maddie asked. Matilda left the question unanswered, but Maddie saw an image of her in her mind. John Eosheka. Filing away that for further reference, Maddie continued to listen to Matilda speak. Charleston is on the other side of the garrison, said Matilda, and it's the last bastion of civilization for quite some time. The wilds start about ten miles west, and the world beyond is untouched until California. But as you keep reminding me, you just want to get home, and the last thing I need to do is burden you with the details of the state of my particular world. They passed through the gate with little pomp or circumstance, and the carriage was then changed. The wheel was replaced with a bay mare that looked worse for wear and despondent about her task. Matilda explained that the method by which the roads worked in town were by no means capable of functioning this far out. It couldn't have been more than six miles, but the journey felt longer now that they were in such unfamiliar territory. Maddie felt naked and scared out in the open, as if the sky were too high, the trees too dense. The forest was old here, the trees covered in moss and lichen, their limbs often barely hanging on. These forests were unattended, probably since the dawn of time. And Randall was gone. He was back in Boston, likely warm in his parlor, smoking a pipe and reading a volume of poetry. He had chosen to stay behind. Matilda was right. He had been a coward. When it came down to it, he was too afraid of Matilda to stand up to her. So much for chivalry. But the Roth brothers never really did adhere to such backward beliefs, teased Matilda, picking up on Maddie's thoughts. Why would Alvin be out here? Maddie tried to change the subject. He would have been brought here. And how will this Raddick person help us? Joss Raddick knows everything that happens in Charleston. Georgiana is right. Joss also happens to have a hand in the steamship Faust, the one that docks in the river, and if there's anything unsavory going on, he'll be alerted to it. He's a remarkable fellow and an old friend to Alvin, most of the time. And look, here we are. What then came into view was nothing but somewhere between an old western ghost town and old Diggerfield, thought Maddie. The homes were dated and shoved close together, not well kept in the least. Everything was snow-covered, muted brown, and practically rotting in the snow. A half dozen carriages convened together, lined up in a row by the longest and cleanest of the buildings. And this is Charleston. The largest building there is the inn, the Green Lion, said Matilda. Most of the carriages are for whores and like, or visiting friends. I see, said Maddie. Sounds like this place is right up your alley. <laughs> My dear, once you cross the garrison, the laws just don't apply. Look, it's Mrs. Roth! called a boisterous voice outside the carriage. A bearded man carrying an axe over one shoulder and wearing a combination of leather and plaid appeared at the window of the carriage, smiling from ear to pockmarked ear. Good to see you again. Been a while. Here for some more trading. I hear we've got a new silk store from Jamaica just yesterday. No, no, personal matters today, I fear, and no business. Though, if it's a particularly good lot, I'll be happy to take a look, Matilda said with a smirk. It is good to see you, Garrett. Garrett opened the door for Matilda and helped her down, continuing to ramble. Much of the town's gone as the herd's on the move. I came by to fell a tree for the green lion, so I did and skipped out on the hunt altogether. Bad knee makes hunting more painful than I'd like, so it was no loss on my part. I presume Captain Raddick is unavailable then? Matilda asked. Not in the least, said Garrett, pointing with his bearded chin toward the largest of the buildings, a low-lying inn with a faded green sign. He's been entertaining some visitors from the south, you see, and he's been at the cards for almost three straight days. 
It's a good thing the flames are blue, you know. Likely he'll find the imprint of the chair on his rear if he doesn't move. Yes, our dear captain has a soft spot for the cards. Last time I paid him a visit, I made out like a bandit, said Matilda, dismissing him with a wave. Good to see you again, Garrett. Send my regards to Gertrude. Of course, Mrs. Roth. Thank you, Mrs. Roth, Garrett said. You're quite the regular here, aren't you? Maddie asked. I go to impressive lengths to get business done. No risk, no reward. Matilda was clearly losing her patience. I wouldn't wander around here alone. Garrett seems okay, but it's kind of rough and tumble, said Maddie. You think I need protection? Dragons above, I can take care of myself, said Matilda. So I see, agreed Maddie. As soon as they set foot in this inn, the temperature rose to the point of discomfort. The fire was warm enough, but in combination with the presence of about two dozen men embattled in a game of cards, smoking and stinking of drink, it was barely tolerable. It smelled like piss and bad grain alcohol, and the room had likely not been swept in months, if not years. The building that housed the inn might once have been magnificent, but now was disheveled. It was characterized by peeling wallpaper, broken lamps, and further punctuated by a dull and uncared-for copper bar top, stained and oxidized. A piano, its paint chipped and keys pulled of ivory, sat despondently across the room. Judging by the dust, no one even bothered playing it anymore. The carpet had holes throughout, like some giant moth had worried its way into the fabric. Even the windows were smeared with the accumulation of so much dust and sweat. And to add to the overall ambiance, the horrors were out in force. The painted ladies looked like burlesque dancers to Maddie, their skirts short, their hair in ringlets, their faces a dazzle of white, blue, and red. One had her arms draped around a big soldier, clad in gray and gold, her head leaning against his. She looked like a lovesick teenager. Maybe she was a teenager. When the door shut behind Matilda, all eyes turned to her immediately. Most looked back at their games pretty quickly, about half looked to be soldiers, while the other half Maddie couldn't place. A few looked like extras from a spaghetti western, their features not entirely native or quite European. She remembered Matilda saying something about natives earlier. Maddie had assumed they were the people in the wilds, considering how Pinga and John looked. But she'd been wrong before. Then she saw Joss Raddick. He was undoubtedly handsome, but as rugged as they come. He had a scar down the left side of his cheek that went up into his hair, ragged and deep enough to speak of a brush with death. But his dark eyes were clear, odd in contrast to his golden hair. His jaw was sharp, his nose broad. He reminded Maddie of a picture she'd seen of Wild Bill Hickok, but more brawny and a little more conventionally handsome with his thick lips and high cheekbones. There you are, you lout, called Matilda. Joss Raddick gave a boisterous laugh, then excused himself from the group. Maddie watched and experienced everything as Matilda giggled and ran into the man's arms. He picked her up and swung her around, then kissed her fully, wetly, on the mouth. He did not smell of alcohol or cigarettes. No, he tasted faintly of lemons, his beard scuffing against her cheek and leaving the scent of cinnamon. Matilda, he said, setting her down, stroking her cheek with his hand. The nightingale returns. Joss. Matilda said, all airs gone. Joss Raddick, there you are. I hear the herds on the move again, but you've been sitting here on your arse, is that right? Joss laughed, his smile exposing his wide-set white teeth. Someone's got to stay behind. And besides, nothing so boring as hunting elk, not this time of year. Might as well pick apples for the ease of it. He pretended to shoot something with a gun and laughed again. You know there's more to it than that, said Matilda, removing her cloak and handing it to him. Joss took it, then offered her a seat. Can I get you something, he asked. Clem's made some decent elk patties, and we've got sandwiches, pudding too, and a whole new cask of rum from the Indies just got in yesterday. Whiskey, she said without hesitation, straight. Who is this new Matilda, asked Maddie, desperate to understand. The old Matilda, Matilda corrected. While the captain went to get Matilda a drink, she surveyed the room, Maddie watching along with her. Rather than stay silent, Matilda narrated what she saw. There are about a dozen other river guard here, mostly poor men who've worked their way up the ranks of society, finally finding the highest position possible. Some are married, but most choose not to. They don't last long out here. What's the danger? Maddie asked. 
everything. The wild, darling, is out there. The gate we pass through runs the length of Boston and its suburbs, as well as some of the smaller towns. Mary protects us with the flames, with her soldiers. The River Guard pledge their lives to her, but other forces are at work, too. So Boston is like a cultural oasis? Maddie asked. Nothing out here ever got civilized? Oh, there's civilization in the wilds, but it's not anything like here. As I said, there are other powers. As Randall mentioned to you, other dragons, gods, what have you. Mary and her brothers and sisters are ever quarreling here, and after the last war, a bargain was struck. Mary was promised the cities along the coast would lie in peace, and her brother, a very powerful and very terrible individual, was given the lands in between. That's why we build our floating palaces, you see. There's no place to grow but up. What was it that John had said about a twain who existed in eight instances? At the time, Maddie had thought he was talking about a twain named Miriam, but Miriam was Hebrew for Mary. He still haven't figured it out, said Matilda. Figured out what, said Maddie. What we are, you ninny. What do you mean, what we are, asked Maddie. But Joss was back, and Matilda had the reins again, and was no longer responding. Joss slid into the chair across from Matilda and grinned, placing the whiskey, which was presented in a surprisingly pristine glass, considering the caliber of the inn, before her. Saints alive, but it's good to see you, he said, lowering his voice. You look lovely, as ever. Ah, the nature of the beast, Matilda said coolly, brushing her hair with the back of her hand. For a brief flash, Maddie saw a glimpse of Matilda's mind. When she said the word beast, Maddie thought she saw white, needled, sharp teeth and wings flecked with blood. If Matilda noticed she'd shared the thought, she gave no indication. But Maddie was growing warier, afraid. Matilda sipped the whiskey, and it burned on the way down. It was so smoky it was almost effervescent. And you? You look as hale as ever. How many years has it been since you've been out here? Joss dropped his voice. Thirty here in the River Guard. So, I'll likely be returning to Philadelphia in a year or two. Start over. People are starting to get suspicious, of course. They always do. At least here, men don't last as long as in many of the places I've been posted. It's been nice to set down roots for a bit. He rubbed the side of his face, taking a sip of his own drink, something that was certainly not alcohol but smelled faintly of sarsaparilla. He looked suddenly ill at ease. Maddie found it odd that he would have been with the River Guard so many years, when he himself looked scarcely out of his forties. But perhaps he was just well-preserved? I never thought I'd hear you say that, Matilda replied. Set down roots? Why, don't tell me you're getting soft. There isn't a woman here satisfying you, or a young lad. No, no, of course not, Joss said, waving Matilda's suggestions away. It's just a good gig, but it's something to a close. You know how it is, feeling a part of something can be good for us? Yes, yes it can, said Matilda. Joss frowned, but without losing the glint of merriment in his eye. You don't just come here unannounced. So what have you got up your pretty little sleeves? I've brought one for Alvin, Matilda said lightly, taking another sip of whiskey. Her voice was full of mirth, and her body trembled as she said it, nearly aroused. Matilda? She tapped her forehead. Here, right here, she's listening. Joss's eyes went wide and he bristled. Matilda. He looked wildly around over his shoulder then lowered his voice. You, you can't just do that. It's not a game. It was Alvin who started the whole game and I am just having my turn. Why is it that he gets to have all the fun? Joss did not respond immediately. He looked behind him and then at Matilda again. Which is she from? he asked in a whisper. Six. She's one of Alvin's. Of particular interest to him, I think. Randall brought her here, and neither of them have any idea how convenient that is. Six? One of Alvin's? Maddie was trying to hold on to con consciousness as hard as she could, but Matilda was pushing her to the edges. No answer. Maddie felt strangled, breathless. Usually she could just cling to Matilda's breathing patterns and scarcely think about it, but now it was, if, was if she were breathing through a straw. She probably didn't need to worry about breathing, considering it was her consciousness and not her physical body at risk here, but it was 
comforting to breathe. Joss didn't miss a beat, and his shoulder slumped. And that's why you're here, of course, trying to find Alvin. You know I'd expected that, but, well, it's a mighty delicate situation, if you understand, Maddie. Alvin's gone a bit rogue on me, and I'm not sure I can trust him. None of us can trust Alvin, but then again, none of us can help what we are, said Matilda softly. Oh, that's right. Alvin can't help being a murderer, and Randall can't help but being a flaky coward, is that it? Joss said, slapping his hand down on the table, making the whiskey spill all over his hands on the grimy tablecloth. The men behind him were too engrossed in their game to take much notice. I'm sure it takes a lot more convincing on that account for even you, Matilda. That's not exactly what I mean, she replied. Joss didn't buy it and sipped his drink again. Well, care to try again, then? Alvin is the maelstrom, and you are the sea. Can't you just calm him down? Sometimes the sea just feeds the storm. You know that. He's losing it. I don't know why he's even more chaotic than usual, like something snapping or snapped. Surely you can take me to him, she said. For my twain's sake, at least, I did promise her closure. Joss shook his head. I don't know. You bring out the worst in Alvin sometimes. Matilda laughed. Besides, Joss continued, what if you're just lying? You do have a history. Listen, she's from Six. You understand. You know what it's like there. She still doesn't believe half of what Randall or I have told her, so I'm trying to make the transition as smooth as possible. Joss smirked. Ah, I see how things are now. You do, asked Matilda. You have no desire to school her. You just want her out or done away with. Seems to me she was brought here against her own volition. I've never heard of someone coming from sixth of their own will, not since the Magdalene. Before Matilda could reply, Joss barreled over her. Maddie liked him just for that. My guess is it was one of Randall's experiments, except he can't get her back, and she can't get herself back, and you can't get rid of her. So you need Alvin. Matilda froze. I want my life back, and yes, Alvin can help. Lies. Matilda was lying. Maddie could feel it, but she couldn't find the truth between the words. Matilda's mind was a fortress, and that worried her a great deal. Everything was closing in, teeth like needles, blood-flecked wings. Something lurked inside Matilda, ready to devour her whole. Joss snorted. You got away, Matilda. Always have. What I don't understand is why in hell you'd want to give this lass a second chance, considering you're probably just planning to dispose of her in the end. Shock etched itself across Matilda's face. Joss sighed. Yes, he's told me what he's been up to. That's Alvin's philosophy, isn't it? And he's done well by it, or so he swears. He keeps trying to tell me to do the same, but I don't want that kind of blood on my hands. Maddie struggled as sight was cut off from her. She could hear but the world faded around her into a black mist. You have plenty of blood there already. What's a little more? Matilda asked. And you enable him. It's hardly different. So you're undecided, Joss said. Not sure if you should kill her or keep her. Kill me? said Maddie. Matilda! Matilda continued, giving no sign she'd heard Maddie. She's not strong enough, nor is she clever enough. The world would not weep for her loss, and she's so ignorant as to think she's got the upper hand. Joss laughed. And what makes you so sure she doesn't? Really, Joss, you insult me. It's simple. I take her to Alvin, explain the situation, and see what he thinks. Randall wanted her here to make up for whatever it is he feels he must, as some insipid gesture of kindness regarding Alvin's departure from her world. And he still trusts me enough to look after her, as if this annoyance of sharing a body, my body, were not inconvenient enough. I think she may have been speaking to Mora. Fine, Joss said, but if there's any killing involved, I'm going to cut out. Oh, come now, Joss. The only death I'm interested right now is the little one. Then Maddie felt a great pressure at the very center of her being, and the next moment, she was thrown from Matilda's body and hurled through the darkness, falling without end, her own consciousness melting away into oblivion and nothingness. Then one last, desperate thought. I'm sorry, Randy. It was the last thought Maddie had, 
for quite some time. There you are. Wake up, child. Mora. Maddie stirred, moving her face toward the source of light. There was snow just at the edge of her vision, expanding into darkness. She moaned and turned around, looking up into the doorway of a small cottage, its open door painted bright red and golden light spilled onto the snow over the door jam. The smell of stew emanated from within, and her stomach growled in response. She immediately thought of lamb and turnips, something she'd never cooked nor to her memory eaten. The figure at the door was black against the light from behind, but as Maddie's eyes adjusted, it became clear. It was Mora. She stood straight, but still leaned on a cane. Her eyes twinkled with something between merriment and amusement. It was the kind of look Maddie's grandmother gave her when she learned she'd done something wonderfully rebellious in her teen years. I can only leave the door open so long before the drafts get too bad, Mora said softly. She chuckled. Unless you're enjoying yourself out there, but I can't imagine you would. Maddie sat up slowly, her joints stiff from being cold so long. She brushed snow from her face, her chest, her pants. She was wearing that old sweater she'd made for Alvin again, but this time she also had mittens and a hat. And it was very much her body. She felt flabby and soft, like a boiled egg. Her ankle ached as she stood, the remnants of an injury from softball when she was a teenager. There we are, come now, the table's set, said Mora, holding the door open wider. Mora turned and entered the cottage. Maddie looked over her shoulder into the dark surrounding the cottage, and the hair rose on the back of her neck. Her neck on her hair. But that was less important than what she saw. Wolves. She could see their outlines there in the dark, see their eyes glitter hungrily. It was enough for her to nearly break into a run. You know that there's... She began, glad to find her voice this time. Wolves? said Mora. Yes, but they're here to protect me, not to hurt me. Oh, I don't think they'd think twice of making a meal out of me if I should stumble toward them, but they do a very good job of preventing anyone from getting here. Which is a comfort, Mora said with a smile. The table, as it turned out, was set in the middle of a one-room cottage and laid with dinner for three. But as it was, so far Maddie saw only Mora. Charming clay bowls were the order of the day, and the napkins had to be hand-embroidered, delicate like something out of the Biltmore, the height of Victorian elegance, odd considering Mora's world was a dim medieval place. A fire roared in the hearth, and three cats twitched their tails nearby, every once and again opening their eyes. The ceiling was hung with herbs dangling from the rafters. Simple, but it's home, Mora said. It's lovely, Maddie said, going to the fire as if drawn to it. I told you that you could come if you wanted, Mora said, and you did. I'm guessing Matilda gave you the boot. Maddie nodded. Her skin felt raw everywhere, even under the leggings she was wearing. Mora continued, This is my world, my place, my real home. Last time we spoke, we were in an in-between place. Neither yours nor mine. Hard to find, those are. How did I get here? Maddie asked. I don't remember trying. Matilda just snuffed me out. I thought I was dying. It'd be a lot harder to kill you than that, Mora said. You likely couldn't get back to your own world, so you came to the closest. Mine. Maddie found the chair surprisingly comfortable, loath as she was to leave the fire, and she sighed contentedly. All of Matilda's presence was gone, not even a shadow remaining. No teeth, no wings, nothing but the peace of a crackling fire and the promise of a meal. Am I here in my own body? she asked looking at her hands. It felt right. Could be, but that, at the moment, is the least of our troubles. Mora tapped her cane on the floor, then proceeded to set out tea. There's a bad wind in the air. Maddie took a cup of tea as it was given to her, and inhaled the soft notes of chamomile and lemon. It didn't smell like opium tea, which was a start. Thank you, Mora. I'm sorry. I don't know the first thing about any of this. You know more than you give yourself credit for. But in the time, if you have time, I must admit I'm a little concerned, said the older woman, taking the seat opposite Maddie. But first. Mora heaved a sigh, then shook her head, her long white locks turning to curly black, the lines of her face filling and then vanishing altogether, until Maddie was looking at a reflection like her in every way save for the length of her hair and the color of her skin. Mora was beautiful, 
ripe as one grown in the fields themselves, and smiling. Much better. You, you lied to me, Maddie said, feeling the betrayal like a kick in the chest. Well, age and wrinkles don't have to go hand in hand, not if you don't want them to, not if you're like us. In fact, none of us are born the way we have to keep. Many of us change our faces as effortlessly as the change of their shoes. Like us? Maddie rolled her eyes. Twains, sisters, cousins, relatives, however you think of us. Maura took Maddie's hand in hers gently. I must say it's absolutely cruel what Randall and Alvin had done to you. Maddie nodded, trying to hold back tears. I'm assuming they haven't told you much more. And here I am, doing no better, shrouding myself in a glamour to pretend I'm something other than my own self. I suppose, at the heart, I'm just worried and... I want to trust you, Madeline. I want us both to trust each other. But I fear it isn't so easy. Maddie frowned. Matilda shoved me out, after she'd given me the impression that we were going to be able to work it out together. Anger flared and she tightened her fists and let them go. Holding on to the teacup was a better strategy. The clay felt so right, so earthy, so real. I want to go home, but... You want to know about Alvin? Taking a sip of tea, Maddie nodded, knowing how stupid it sounded. Every sign points to the fact that he's a colossal asshole, but I can't let go until I know for sure. Randall was right about that, at least. I'm just not sure his methods were entirely ethical. But Randy, he's probably the only person in the whole world that I trust, and he gave me his blessing to find Alvin. I just don't understand. You need closure, of course. And I thought Matilda was the key to that, but she kicked me out. I don't understand. It's because you're growing more powerful, and Matilda is frightened of you. Frightened of me? Maddie tried not to laugh. There were only three of us right now, all across eight worlds, Maura said, and Matilda's been working with Alvin's help to swiftly do away with what is now that she knows of us. I have hidden from her here, but I'm beginning to think she suspects. I know she does, Maddie said, shaking her hand. I'm getting the feeling that even when she's away, she's listening. I tried not to think about you like you said, but don't worry yourself, child. It was just a matter of time. In spite of her words, Maura looked rather worried. I want to believe you, but it's like you said, trust isn't easy, Maddie said. Maura sipped her tea, almost at the same moment that Maddie did, but she smiled behind her cup. Her lips were so very red that Maddie expected lipstick to stay behind. I have no doubt that Randall, less his yellow little soul, has tried to tell you as well. Matilda has too in her way, I'm sure. But she likes to see you squirm, likes to see you thrash about like a hooked fish. That's what I felt like when she was talking to Joss Raddick. You met Joss Raddick and she still didn't tell you, Mora asked, clearly shocked. Tell me what? Why, that were dragons, dear. Facets of the goddess. Dragons? was all that Maddie could say. Mora pursed her lips, thinking, Consider the gods, all the gods you've heard of. Gods of life and death, destruction and rebirth, so many, so similar, some strange and cruel and terrible true, but there are threads connecting them all. You know there are stories in every language and culture about individuals with power beyond human capabilities. Sometimes they're saints like your Saint Mary and Saint Paul. Sometimes they're gods like Hephaestus, like Athena, yes? Yes. Doesn't it make more sense now? The reincarnation, the twains, the sheer intelligence and capabilities of the people you've met, your inability to connect fully with friends, your limited family, your connections to other twains like Ian and Agnes. Maddie wanted to dispute it, but she felt a strange flush wash over her body with the realization. It shouldn't make sense, but it did. God, I feel so stupid for not figuring this out sooner, gasped Maddie. How do we die? Do we die? Matilda acts like she's immortal. No, not entirely. And that's the problem. You see, we can't be killed by usual means. We may age as we wish, past our forties, and plenty choose to. Some fade, sail to strange islands in between our worlds. Other dragons may hurt us, wound us, bruise us, and make us bleed. But we cannot die in the ordinary way. John hurt Miriam here in second, most grievously, and this is at the heart of the discord. No, the only way we can truly die is to be killed by one of our twains, or take our own lives. Most often we simply diminish. Maddie swallowed on a dry throat, then took another sip of tea. Her heart was thumping in her chest, and she was frightened. Suddenly, Mora was far more terrifying to her than before. And Alvin, 
would have become of this twain in her own world if it had not been an accident, after all? So Alvin's figured it out, said Maddie. How to kill his twains. That's why he doesn't want to see me. Alvin believes that by eliminating his twains, he can be more powerful, that he can achieve full enlightenment, that he can ascend. It is rumored among us that when all other twins are eliminated in a particular set, the remaining individual would be complete, an embodiment of the original God, not fragmented and cast about the world as we are now. That individual could move from one world to the other, a true God in every sense, rather than merely a dragon. And with this power, not only could they kill other twains, but they could prevent any others from arising in their stead. It's a tempting fate, but it was not tried until Alvin. He used physics to figure out how to travel, Maddie said, to predict certain events in time. That's what Randall said. She paused. But he's clearly not yet a god, so he can't have done it yet, can he? He has not succeeded. But throughout the ages, he has tried. Alvin, Loki, Coyote, Puck, Quidian. Many have been born and revered by mankind. He has not always been this ruthless, so our stories say, but more often than not, he stirs dissent among us for his own needs. Someone's got to stop him, Maddie said. But how the hell can we stop him if we can only maim him? At the moment, he suspects, but does not yet know where his last twain resides. But he is pressed for time. He consults his equations and knows that soon, one of those he's killed will be reborn again, and then he will have to start all over. How do you know all this? Maddie asked. I have never been reborn. I am now as I was first made, unlike you. But within you are memories of hundreds of lifetimes, and in that is a great deal of power, should you be able to access it. You are gifted that way. Alvin would want to use it if he could, or else destroy you and prevent you from using that information. I suspect part of his interest in you is seeding them that knowledge, or rather, his desire for it. Maddie could scarcely believe that this was something she knew or had the potential to know that Alvin didn't. She would have laughed if it were not for the somber atmosphere. That son of a bitch, said Maddie. Her tea had gone cold through the conversation and she set it on the table. And he was with me just to keep tabs on me, to test me. You don't think Randall knows, do you, about the memories? Maura rose and went to the fire, rubbing her hands together. She adjusted the shawl around her shoulders and stared at Maddie. I do not know Randall as you do, but I know his twain in this world, a man named Ravel. In my experience, his kind is not so devious, but often rather self-absorbed. That's not terribly heartening. I've heard him called a coward and selfish now. I can sure pick him. You love him? I don't think I can help myself, Maddie said, feeling the weight of misery and simultaneous excitement from admitting it. It all feels so inevitable. I would have with Randy, but, but what child? Love is love. There's no shame in it. We were all made for it, after all. We? And who are you suggesting we are? Maddie thought a moment, remembering what Matilda had told her before. Then it dawned on her. Aphrodite. Matilda! She tried to tell me. She was talking about love, sex, and power. And John said I had the heart of a dove. Yes, love and beauty have many faces, my dear. You and your aunt, Matilda and her fashion, me and my weaving, Maura said, gesturing to the table where the embroidered napkins were still folded. But it's simply our ruling passion, not the one that defines us. So understand that. It is not all we are. We are much more. And the others. Pinga was a huntress, like Artemis, but Inuit or something. I suppose there's plenty of other parallels. Indeed, said Maura. Ian? John? No idea. Though he is often given the name of All Father, or Father of the Gods, he is no more than a god with the ability to create and the honor of being the first. Maddie bit down on her lip to keep from giggling. Zeus? Ian is Zeus? More or less. Mostly less. Maura grinned back in response. And Randall, I, I can't quite place him. I called him Yellow earlier, but Golden is more like it. He is an avatar of knowledge and light, of healing, he has helped to heal your heart, indeed, Maura said. And he is a golden child, beauty embodied. But it's no surprise we are so often drawn to him. Apollo? Really? To use your Greeks as an analogy, yes. It is said as such. You might call him Thoth as well, or Utu, or another of the golden children. 
Maddie had to stand. She was feeling like crawling out of her skin. It felt too tight, too itchy, too bumpy. She wanted out, but there was nowhere to go. So she paced the floor of Moore's cottage, wrapping her arms around her, trying to put the pieces together, excited and terrified. God, this is so much to absorb. So forgive me for being so bold, but why the hell are you helping me? You're not interested in the kind of power Alvin seeks, Maddie asked. The other woman frowned, shaking her head, then biting down on her lower lip. I believe that the key to healing the rifts among us has nothing to do with killing others off and has everything to do with leaving us all to our own worlds, to preservation. Separate but equal, you mean? Maura sighed again, and Maddie wondered if she was frustrated with her, but no sooner had she thought it than the woman smiled. Ever since the Twains began traveling between worlds, we have lost our golden age. Once we were able to have children, now it is so rare. And now all is chaos, we are out of balance. Alvin and Matilda and their ilk are pushing us further apart, tempting the powerful with even more power. Science and magic, together it's a horrifying business. But not all of us have lost hope. It sounds hopeless, said Maddie. Well, there's one other thing you see, said Maura, gesturing to the empty seat beside them. Taking another minute to compose herself, Maura smoothed the front of her smock and went to the door that stood be between a bookshelf and the fireplace. She called something softly to it and then stood to the side. Coming, said a young man's voice, followed by hasty footsteps. Then there was Alvin, Alvin at 16, with moppy hair and a gawky gait and nut-brown skin, the same impossibly dark eyes and easy smile. Seeing that face, as young as it was, still caused Maddie's stomach to drop out from beneath her. She felt like her insides had gone to liquid. She had not believed until that moment. Not truly. The concept of Alvin living still felt intangible in spite of the wondrous things she had seen in the last few days. Now seeing his twain before her with her own eyes, so young and innocent and new, shocked her into the true realization. This is my son, Arthur, said Mora. Arthur's predecessor is many millennia gone, and we have waited for his return. I have tried to protect him, to shield him from Alvin, but I believe Alvin will be coming for him. Soon. Maddie bit her tongue, wanting to make a quip about the shallow gene pool, but Arthur was too sweet and sincere for her to be so cruel. Good day, said Arthur, his expression slightly suspicious. He looked from Maddie to Mora and back again. Who's this? Mother, is she your sister? said Maddie quickly. I'm your mother's sister, Madeline. Magdalene? asked Arthur. Madeline, but you can call me Maddie, said Maddie. And Matty, okay, he replied, grinning. Maura drew closer to Maddie and clasped her hands in her own, squeezing tight. Her touch was painful, burning, but Maddie endured it. I risked a great deal in letting you in through here. I put a hole in our defenses, defenses that took thousands of years to build. Alvin may now be able to reach the first world if they discover Arthur is here. So you must convince Matilda to spare you. If Arthur manages to come here, if Alvin manages to come here, he will find us, and I will have little help save the wolves. Maddie felt the urge to cry, to sob, to gather Mora up into her arms and cradle her there, and weep until the tears were gone and the sea had risen up around them. She did not doubt that it was a possibility, considering that they were. I just don't know how to get back. Matilda threw me out. Look into yourself. You've done it before. For ages you have traveled, wandered. Now should be no different, said Mora. Think on your greatest gift. Pull it around you like a mantle and follow the strand where you want to go. I, I can't. I just still your soul and follow the strand. Hold these if it helps. Sometimes all we need is a little reminder. Maura reached down the front of her shirt and pulled out a long string of eight pearls, large as muscadine grapes, and pressed them into Maddie's hand. Sitting down, Maddie set her jaw. Then she closed her eyes, tears falling down her cheeks. Now, you must return to Matilda. You must save yourself. Only then do we have hope of redeeming Alvin, of saving Arthur. I believe it is what Randy wanted. I'll try, Maddie said, clutching the string of pearls. One was darker than the rest. Instinctively, she knew it was first world, where she was. To the right, second. She pressed the second pearl to her lips and breathed deep. At first, nothing happened. She could hear Mora's fire, sense the sturdy chair beneath. She almost sobbed for the feeling of failure.
Then she tried to remember the stillness of meditation. She imagined that the seat sank away from her, and she went down through the floor, feeling her limbs fly out from her sides, suspended in air as if gravity had given up. And she thought of Randy, the first time she had seen him, standing to the side of the Lichtenstein in the Fine Arts Center, and it felt as if she was exploding from within, as a huge expression of energy and light filled up the darkness entirely. Out of the blinding white light, she saw eight spheres emerge, brilliant and polished opal. She guided herself toward the brightest one, pressing forward with what was left of her being. She had a sudden violent image of herself in Dr. Keat's bathroom, Randy towering over her with a concerned look on his face. She was slumped on the back black and white tile floor, bleeding from the nose. Her home world called her. But if Matilda didn't manage to kill her off now, she would find her later. And the last thing she wanted to unleash on her world was the venom of one such as her. Maddie was tired of running away, tired of turning tail. She was done with it. So she turned toward the opal spheres and followed one of the strands, the polar opposite as in her own compact, her compass. Second world, she could feel it. The sphere of second world was a million colors, refracting and moving in light and time. But as she approached it, the surface shifted, became smooth and shiny. It was a mirror, a window, a portal. And there, the side of Matilda's face bent closely over another, Joss Raddick. She continued on and followed the strand, a bolt of white energy projecting from the heart of her and into the next world.